السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين So alhamdulillah for the past uh, five weeks we've been going through the uh, events that have taken place around uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Al-Quds, uh, Bayt Al-Maqdis, all of these different names we have uh, covered and uh, in the land which is now known as Palestine. And uh, we, in the previous session, we reached up to 1947. And uh, the events that followed on in 1948. Uh, so before we continue today, inshallah, we'll just do a quick uh, run through and a summary uh, of what we covered uh, in last week's session. So last week, in, uh, to quickly go through, we covered the Peel Commission, which was the initial partition uh, proposal by the British in 1937. If you remember during the Arab Revolt. I keep going back to some of these events just so that we can have the full picture in our minds. Uh, then uh, we discussed in detail the UN partition plan uh, of November 1947. And uh, we discussed the details, uh, we discussed the deadlines that were given the 1st of August for the British to uh, withdraw and then the 1st of October for the uh, new states to be established, a, an Arab state and a, um, a Jewish state. Uh, thereafter we discussed the British response, they didn't vote in favour of the plan, uh, they then had an internal board meeting in December uh, where they decided that they will withdraw and end the British mandate on the 14th of May 1948. And uh, after the declaration, the UN partition plan, uh, the unrest basically grew into what was called a civil war uh, and the attacks were taking place from the various different Zionist groups and also the uh, local Palestinians uh, who had arms and who didn't have arms against the, uh, the Jewish populace wherever they were located and we went through in details with regards to uh, events that took place we mentioned the Deir Yassin massacre in detail um, and we went through other events as well and as we said uh, so up to this point up to 1947 uh, through the land purchases uh, through um, economic pressures so not just the purchase of the land was high which then caused other people to sell their land and etc but as we know uh, even in areas in our city for example the areas that are high in demand what happens is the rent of uh, people push the rent prices up and as rent prices up the people who are living there can't afford to pay the rent and so sometimes they have to move out move to other areas so this also took place so there were Palestinians and local Arabs who were uh, renting uh, places when the um, uh, Zionist Fund, for example, would support uh, migrant Jews to, per uh, um, to rent accommodation in this area, all the rent prices would go up, so they would have to move out. So eventually, uh, by 1947, almost 100,000 Palestinians had already been uh, removed from their homes. So this is before the Nakba. Yeah? So 100,000 Palestinians have already been removed by this time. Um, and then we, met, we went through a lot of the um, attacks that took place uh, and the, t the type and the style of attacks that were taking place at the time. Uh, and then we mentioned a few key figures. So we mentioned David Ben-Gurion who went, then went on to become the first Israeli Prime Minister um, and uh, before that he was leading the uh, Zionist cause uh, and um, the Haganah, the paramilitary force. Uh, we we talked about King Abdullah the first of Jordan, who was the son of. Who was he the son of? And remember from last week. King Abdullah the first of Jordan. He was the son of Faisal. And you remember Faisal was remember the Sharif uh, of Mecca of Hijaz, who was sponsored by the British. Yeah, uh, and then they changed their allegiance and their sponsorship because of the. 
uh, disagreement of Palestine. So uh, he was the son of um, King Faisal and he was in Jordan and he basically was allied with the British. And we had uh, who, Amin al Husseini, who had been uh, designated by the British at a young, as a young age as the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and uh, the role that he played and uh, because he plays a significant role uh, for example uh, I think just about 10 or 11 years ago Benjamin Netanyahu gave, an, uh, gave a speech at the World Zionist Congress which still exists the one that we, dis that we are covering and uh, at that Congress he said that uh, the instigation of the uh, Holocaust uh, of the Holocaust and the killing of all the Jews and uh, the Nazi hate for the Jews was instigated by uh, Mufti Amin al Hussein. Uh, this is what Benjamin Netanyahu said in that conference. He was then uh, rebutted by within their own Zionist circles, who then said, No, that can't be true because then you're belittling the Holocaust. But anyway, that's a different story. But we mentioned Amin al Husseini, who was in Nazi Germany during Second World War II, and then thereafter, after going to a few countries, he came to Egypt. Uh, and then thereafter we discussed the background of the war of 1948 so if you quickly go in brief we talked about the Palestinian forces how the British had cracked down on them from 36 to 39 10% uh, of them were killed so 5,000 uh, were killed and or imprisoned uh, as compared to only 400 Jews and, and uh, 200 British and uh, the number of weapons that was seized from the Palestinians, 13,200 compared to how many was seized from the Jews. And we discussed that the leadership was not central, the leadership was broken, there wasn't one leadership, uh, not only in Palestine, Palestine but the whole Arab uh, region did not have a united leadership. Yes, the Arab League did, League did exist, but we'll see that there were problems. Um, and then we discussed the Zionist military uh, or the, the weapons that they had prior to 1948 and the local Palestinians didn't really have much they were also prepared for war they were also prepared for war so they entrenched their towns uh, barbed wire fences all of these things which we mentioned which which is very important because once the war starts we'll see what took place and then we discussed the Deir Yassin massacre which is in April so remember the date of the British withdrawal is 14th of May so this is a month before yeah, this is a month before. And then uh, we discussed the casualties in the massacre. Now, let's uh, talk about the war. So, who are the parties who are taking part in this war? So, uh, first of all, we have the Zionist forces initially, which then were named as the Israeli forces. Now, the war starts on 15th of May. So, the British withdraw on. Uh, 14th and they leave a vacuum they didn't hand it over to anybody as we said last week so the war starts immediately the next day on the 15th and you have uh, under uh, Ben Gurion in Tel Aviv has declared a an Israeli state so what we have is on the uh, before the 29th of May so the first 15 days of the war what we have is we have all of these different groups we've covered some of them before so we have the main group who's initially who eventually ends up being the main bulk of the uh, army is the Yishuv group we have the Haganash we've covered them a number of times already in details um, of how most of them were part of the British forces assessing the um, part of the Jewish battalions in World War two and some of them had even taken part in uh, battles in World War one and then we have the Palmak the Hish the him, the Irgun, the Lehi, and we mentioned these two last groups as well. The Lehi group was the, is known as the Stern Gang. Um, and then there were also foreign volunteers. So there were volunteers who had come from other countries and not necessarily were they all Jews. Some of them were not Jews. Uh, but they had come to uh, assist the Zionist um, uh, project in Palestine. And then after 29th of May, all of the, these groups were basically brought in together under one command. Um, so all of the individual commanders etc some were changed eventually they were brought in, into like a formalized uh, military formation after the 29th of May 1948 and then on the other side we have the what was called al jaysh al inqad al-Arabi the Arab Salvation Army this consisted of Egypt uh, Transjordan so remember at that time it was called Transjordan Jordan hasn't come yet uh, we have Iraq, Syria, Lebanon Saudi Arabia, there were a few from Yemen, 
um, but it wasn't significant. Uh, we have what was known as the Arab Liberation Army, and then we have the Holy War Army or Jaish Al Jihad Al Muqaddas. Now, the Holy War Army is mainly made up of uh, Palestinians with some foreigners. The Arab Liberation Army is mainly foreigners. Okay. Um, now, looking at it, you've got how many countries there? Egypt, Transjordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, you've, and then you've got Yemen. Um, so you've got what? Seven, seven different countries, and then you have the local Palestinians. So looking at this, you think that the number of forces are going to be very one-sided. You've got immigrants coming into the land of Palestine. Yeah, okay, they've been coming in the tens of thousands and uh, over 50,000, 60,000 in one year uh, over the past few uh, couple of decades. But they're still foreigners in a foreign land. And these are natives, Arabs who've been living there for millennia. So the numbers should be heavily on the Arab side as compared to the um, the Zionist forces but in reality the numbers that were sent from each of these countries were very small were very small and according to the historians and, and, and all of the accounts uh, when you look at the actual numbers of the army although the, the Israeli historians uh, who are supporting the Zionist narrative they, give, they portray it as if it was another David versus Goliath because we were nothing and there were all of these Arab states surrounded from all four sides. It was David versus Goliath and David won. But if you look at the actual numbers that even the, the Israeli historians and the Jewish historians have, have written and all the historians, the numbers are basically uh, that the Israeli Defense Forces had about approximately 30,000 soldiers at the start. 30,000 soldiers at the start. And remember, we already covered that most of these forces were already fighting in World War, World War II under the British, the Jewish battalions. Um, so these were all highly trained soldiers. They were fully military soldiers. And they had all battle experience as well. And they were uh, from amongst them, there were a few thousand special forces. Uh, some, some give the number slightly higher, some slightly lower, but approximately 30,000, which uh, they initially started off with, but quickly they went up to about 60,000 within uh, a short period of time. Um, by the end of the war, which is in March 1949, the number of soldier, soldiers were 120,000. And that's a lower estimate. According to Benny Morris, uh, who's, who's an Israeli historian, he said that the uh, forces were 150,000. 150,000. Now, if you look at the Arab side, we have Egypt. They sent initially a, a few, they sent about 10,000 and Towards the end of the war, the number of troops it used was about 20,000. Uh, we have Transjordan, 7,500 to 10,000 by the end of the war. Um, Iraq, 2,000. Eventually, the end of the war, 15,000. So if you look, the numbers are small. Then it goes even less. Syria, 2,500 to 5,000. Lebanon, 400 to 1,000. Max, max. It was probably less than that. Uh, and they didn't even fight during the whole war. Uh, then you have... Saudi Arabia only sent 800 to 1200 at the, by the end of the year. Um, the Arab Liberation Army, which were basically volunteers uh, and not really soldiers, uh, they were at the beginning 3500 by the end 6000. And uh, Jaish al Jihad al Muqaddas, or the Holy War Army, who are mainly uh, Palestinians and some uh, volunteers from other Arab countries. Uh, they also had approximately 500 volunteers from Bosnia and Serbia. Um, uh, they numbered uh, the numbers of uh, their numbers actually vary quite a bit. Uh, yes, they had support of approximately 50,000, but none of them were actually fighters. Uh, they were just individuals who were supporting them. Uh, the fighters, they say, maximum was five to ten thousand. But even that, that may be pushing it. If you look at some of the battles, for example, they only had 100 soldiers uh, in some of the battles in which they were, they were fighting. So the numbers were probably not really to uh, five uh, in, the, in the high thousands. The leaders, uh, well, Egypt was obviously, they had set a military general. Transjordan had their own general, uh, as did uh, Iraq, although the Iraq forces were joined with the Transjordanian forces. Uh, and then we had Syria and Lebanon, 
they had their own uh, forces that were sent but they were supposed to be working together um, and then we have Saudi Arabia now Saudi Arabia didn't send it uh, they just sent soldiers they didn't they didn't have like a flag or anything what they did was they worked under the Arab League um, and they sent their soldiers under the Egyptian commanders so the Saudi and the Yemeni forces were there about maybe 300 were under the um, Egyptian flag or under the Egyptian commanders the now just to understand here the Holy War Army and the Arab Liberation Army so we have the Arab League and you have Transjordan who was slowly sort of out of the Arab League agreement um, so they're on one side these are the official state armies okay then we have these two at the bottom the Arab Liberation Army and the Holy War Army the Holy War Army uh, was headed by Abdul Qadir al Husseini and a man called Hassan Salama. Abdul Qadir al Husseini, now you remember the, the, the Mufti, he was, his son was also al Husseini. So they were relatives. They were relatives, they were from the same family. Uh, ha- however, uh, the father of Abdul Qadir al Husseini, uh, he, wa- he had a senior position uh, during the Ottoman times. So during the Ottoman rule and the Ottoman Khilafah, Uthmani Khilafah, the father of uh, Abdul Qadir al Husseini, uh, Musa, he had uh, senior roles. In fact, he was sent as an emissary to other countries like uh, Iraq and uh, in, in, in Sham and all the different areas he was sent by the Uthmani Khilafah until eventually he was given the title of Pasha, Pasha by the uh, Uthmani Khilafah. So he held a senior role. And uh, he was sort of seen as the uh, go-to person or the, or the sort of like the leader of the uh, people in the land of Al-Quds and Palestine. And as you mentioned, uh, there was one other family as well, but uh, without going back to them. So uh, he was seen as one of the main leaders, if not the main leader. He was one of the first who spoke, or if not the sp- first leaders to speak against the British, Musa, so the father of Abdul Qadir. He spoke against the British during the British Mandate of Palestine after the uh, uh, after World War One. Uh, he was one of the first who took up arms against the British in the uprisings in 1936, etc. And he fought. He had to, um, and he he told people to demonstrate. Sorry, he told people to demonstrate against the British. The British came in. They beat him. Uh, he was beaten really badly by the British forces, and uh, he became bedridden until his death. So that was the father of Abdul Qadir al Hussein. Abdul Qadir al Husseini he followed in his father's footsteps, but he eventually he had to leave. Then eventually he comes back to Palestine, and when he comes back, he basically this was his personal force. This uh, Jaish al Jihad al Muqaddas or the Holy uh, War Army was basically regarded as the personal force of Abdul Qadir al Husseini, and uh, all of the men were basically under his control, and he came in. But he was, uh, so he came in with his, with his force. Now he collected force from the local Palestinians. He also uh, gained volunteers from the uh, other countries. So from the other Arab countries, he tried to gain volunteers from uh, what we know as Syria, from Jordan, from Al-Iraq, uh, from, Al- from Egypt. So he, gained, he got volunteers to fight with him. On the other side, we have Hassan Salama. Uh, Hassan Salama, his father was also uh, known, but Hassan Salama became very prominent, uh, again uh, speaking against the uh, Zionist overtake uh, in Palestine before this took place so in the 1930s. Um, and uh, he, he went on again to play a significant role. He went to Germany as well, just as the Mufti Amin did. He went to Germany uh, and he served as an aide to the Mufti there. Um, during World War II, uh, when he returned, he was also he also went to Serbia. Uh, without going into too much detail of World War II and other countries, but the reason why there were 500 troops, Serbian troops there, was because if you remember, Serbia was allied, or the Serbian Muslims were allied with uh, Germany uh, for a while in World War II. So there were a lot of uh, Serbian Muslim troops who were trained by the uh, German army on part of the uh, German SS in World War II. Uh, and so these 500 were the soldiers uh, who had formerly served served in um, uh, in the Nazi armies or the German armies in World War II, and they had come with uh, Hassan Salama uh, to Palestine uh, to join this force. 
uh, Hassan Salama. Uh, now, when we look at all of these individuals, they're significant because what happens afterwards is uh, their son, for example, or they play a significant role in the um, in the uh, formation of uh, future groups or leaderships uh, or leadership that happens later on in Palestine, and this is something which we find uh, across the world, not just there. It's, it's uh, um, although the aristocracy ends or the kingship ends, for example, the monarchy ends, uh, so he doesn't go from the king to his son, etc. In terms of the actual leadership uh, in some countries, but you still end up with, um, for example, even in the UK, you have peership uh, based on your uh, lineage based on your lineage so if you go to the house of lords in the uk for example uh, over a hundred of the those who sit in the house of lords uh, uh, or majority of them are there because of uh, their lineage because of their lineage not because they are elected um, so uh, the same so if you look you have for example uh, robert peel then you have his son who did the appeal commission and then his grandson etc so all, all of them they pay they they, they hold significant roles uh, so it's it's no different to wherever you go in the world. Uh, so the same thing there. These individuals are significant because their fathers or their children and their children did play significant roles uh, afterwards in what took place. So Abdul Qadir al Husseini, um, uh, for example, uh, he when he led his troops, so he started the war, but he was uh, killed uh, and martyred with uh, while fighting against. He was killed while fighting against the Zionist forces and uh, in June in June and so once uh, he was killed basically the uh, Holy War army sort of dissolved because he it was mainly his army once he was killed then they didn't really pay much of a uh, or have much of an impact for the rest of the war uh, and he was killed early on he was killed in June so he wasn't he wasn't even leading the forces for a month um, and uh, yeah so he, he was killed in a place called Al Qastal and his, his son was uh, Faisal Al Husseini and uh, Faisal Al Husseini he went on to be a uh, the leader of Fatah one of the uh, famous uh, one of the largest Palestinian organizations and his son went on to become the leader Faisal um, and he was also uh, a minister in the PLO government etc so uh, that's Abdul Qadir Al Husseini Hassan Salam on the other hand um, as we said, he paid a. Uh, he also played a significant ro role uh, from the 1913. Sorry, so after so after the First World War, British mandate. Then he played a role here, a significant role here. He was fighting. Then eventually he had to uh, leave. Uh, people turned against him, uh, etc. But um, uh, eventually he 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 also uh, died uh, on the second second of June 1948 in Ras Al Ain. Uh, which is again in, in, in Palestine during this war. So both of them, the leaders of the Holy War Army, died early on in uh, the battles, in these battles. They were on the front line, they died, and they were killed. And so basically the Holy War Army uh, came to an end. Uh, again, he has his son Ali Hassan Salama, and uh, Ali Hassan Salama was uh, killed by Mossad agents uh, for being... Uh, the founder of what was known as uh, Black September Group, uh, which was the group that carried out the uh, attacks um, in the uh, Olympics, in the Olympics, and he was known as uh, the one who instigated and, and organized all of these attacks. So that was his father. Uh, so you can see that there's significant uh, relationships there. Anyway, so the numbers, if we look, we said about thirty thousand on the uh, Zionist forces. On the Arab forces initially, there were only 13,000. And then they went up by the end of the war to around 55,000. The numbers vary between uh, 51,000 and a few hundred to a maximum about 63, 64, pushing it 65,000. But that was the maximum number of uh, um, fighters in, on, the, on the Arab side. And there's a massive difference. So you can see 13,000, 30,000. Towards the end, 120,000, 55,000, according to um, uh, uh, the, some of the other his historians, it was 150,000 and 65,000 or 60,000. So you can see there's more than double at the end of the war. Um, and you can see how the war progresses. We'll see how the war progresses. 
Now one thing to know here is The question might be that Why are there so less forces? Why are there so less forces? Uh, obviously without going into too much uh, military analysis And political analysis of the time But in brief there were a few reasons uh, One was that the uh, All of these forces they weren't united um, So or let's say before that uh, A lot of these forces they had a disregard For the Zionist military apparatus So they uh, thought uh, that they're not going to be of much might We have our state armies They should be more than enough to defeat Whatever they have So they um, devalued Or um, uh, Did not uh, assess Their uh, opponent very well uh, So that's one reason that is given uh, Another reason is that They did not want to face Too many losses And so they put what they thought Would be a suitable number For them to go into battle a third reason which is given is that uh, A third reason is that The Alab, uh, the Holy War Army uh, This uh, by Abdul Qadir al-Husseini uh, This army uh, or this force It was uh, on the brink of gaining a lot of support From all of the different Arab countries And getting a lot of volunteers And it had a lot of public support So uh, what these states, or mainly the Arab League did, what they did was They set up the Arab Liberation Army To stop people from joining the Holy War Army uh, So the Arab Liberation Army would be an army that is under their direct control yeah? So it's under their direct control, accepting volunteers Volunteers were not in the regular armies of the countries So, um, so, they, have, so they set up the Arab Liberation Army so that people don't join the Holy War Army Therefore the whole Holy War Army won't gain uh, supporters, they won't gain as many fighters Because it's not under their control yeah, It's not under their complete control um, uh, For them, Abdul Qadir al-Husseini and, and uh, uh, Hassan Salam are basically like a loose cannon They won't come under Egyptian control or under Transjordanian control Once the war is over um, So they make the Arab Liberation Army uh, They allow a few people to join So you can see about 3,500 Maximum 6,000 by the end of the war But again It's there to stop people from joining the Holy War Army But they still did not allow people to even join the Arab Liberation Army They put a lot of limits and restrictions So the numbers never increased The real reason was not to get people to come and join the war uh, or, the, or the efforts of fighting in Palestine The real reason was to stop people to join the Holy War Army So it was there just uh, for the sake of being there uh, satisfied a few people That there's this uh, group that's fighting And there are people who have gone So these are the reasons that are given For the small uh, numbers As compared to the populations of all of these areas uh, Also When we look at the numbers What happens is that there's Mass migration that takes place From the 15th of May So as soon as uh, The British withdraw Then remember the British had put a a uh, cap on the migration As soon as the British withdrew They stopped all, all efforts In stopping anybody from going to Palestine And so there was mass migration Whereas before we had like uh, 65,000 which was seen as a very high number If you look, if you remember the previous uh, Charts uh, We had in some years here over 100,000 Coming into uh, Palestine And this year we had 100, 120,000 Within a period of 12 months uh, Entering uh, Jews from different countries from around the world coming in So uh, let's go through the key points of the war So the war starts on the 15th well, Remember this, from the 1st of uh, April until the 14th of May The fighting was already ongoing And the Jewish forces had already done major military operations And we've covered a few of them and a few of the massacres that took place But 8 out of 13 So they did 13 major military operations In that month and a half Out of 13 major military operations 8 of them were outside of the Jewish state boundaries That had been designated by the UN yeah? So they are already fighting outside of their boundaries That had been designated for them And remember that the, the vision was From the river uh, or, or the vision was greater Israel uh, The whole land So they had already started attacking Outside of the area that has been designated by the UN 
Now, when everything starts on the 15th of May, uh, as soon as the British withdraw, the Iraqi uh, forces, the Syrian forces, the Jordanian forces, the, the um, uh, Lebanese forces, Egyptian forces, they all come in. They straight away on the 15th, they all come into, they all come into Palestine. So Palestine is entered on three fronts, on three fronts. Now, this is where we want to look at the map. So if you look at the map, let's start from the south. So if you start from the south, um, the border here is with Egypt. Yeah? The border is with Egypt. So this area here on the uh, westmost point is uh, Gaza or Gaza. And this dark green area here is what has been designated by the UN. Yeah, has been designated by the UN. And same as this dark green area here. And the blue areas is where mainly the um, Jewish settlements are in Palestine. So what happens is Egypt comes in from the south. Egypt comes in from the south from Gaza area. And they also come into this uh, area here which is not really inhabited. It's not really inhabited. That's the area where the people of Banu Israel were uh, kept at the time of Musa alayhi yeah? salam. The, the empty quarter. So uh, the Egyptian forces come into the empty quarter, they come into Gaza, and their aim is to go north uh, to central Israel towards Tel Aviv. Towards Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is the headquarters of the Zionist uh, Congress in uh, Palestine. That's where they made the announcement of the Israeli state. Um, so uh, Tel Aviv is midway there. So that's the job of the uh, Egyptian forces and those who are underneath the Egyptian uh, command. From the east, we have the Transjordan, uh, Transjordan forces and with them the Iraqi forces. So again, the Iraqi forces were, uh, were there alongside the Jordanian Transjordan forces. So they come in from this side. Their goal was basically to push in from uh, the east and take over all of these areas, take over Jerusalem and head towards Tel Aviv from the east. Head towards Tel Aviv from the east. So that was the job of the Jordanian forces and the Iraqi forces. And then we have Syria, who's in this north, and Lebanon. There's four, the Syrian and Lebanese, uh, the, uh, and the Lebanese forces, their job was to come in from the north and uh, slowly head down towards Tel Aviv as well. But they were supposed to come in from the north and then join up with the uh, forces of uh, Transjordan and Iraq and thereafter head towards Tel Aviv. So these are the three areas where they were supposed to go. Now what happens is from these armies, you could say the most advanced army was the Egyptian army. The most advanced was the Egyptian army. And uh, the Egyptian army at that time, they had fighter jets. So they had uh, Spitfires, uh, which were used in World War II. They had about five or six. They had a, a few Spitfires. Uh, they had a few other uh, aircraft. They had tanks. Um, and they had some uh, heavy artillery. So this was the most advanced of all of these Arab armies. Uh, and then you had the Transjordan army, which had some heavy artillery, but they didn't really have any fighter jets or etc. that they were using to bomb. And nor did the Syrians army didn't really have much um, uh, weaponry. And the Lebanese didn't see that they were mainly light, uh, light weapons. So you have uh, this was basically the four, the the armaments of the uh, Arab armies or the Arab League. On the other side, the at the beginning of the war, we saw that they had some heavy artillery, but they had a lot of light weapons. But they had made up the fortifications, the Zionist groups um, in in Palestine. Uh, but they didn't have any. Uh, they didn't really have, well they had a few planes they had a few light aircraft which they had in a airfield just outside Tel Aviv just outside Tel Aviv they had the uh, military airbase the Tel Aviv military airbase and that's where they had a few light aircraft although initially those light aircraft didn't bring them any uh, wasn't of any use at the beginning of the war um, they had uh, three ships uh, military ships warships uh, what they had done was they had procured these even before the war had started. So they had these um, from the previous year. But what they had done was they were all former military ships. So it was a former uh, USS destroyer, two um, Canadian military uh, warships uh, that had gone out of service for the Canadian military and the US military. They were purchased uh, by a businessman, covered up to make it look like they were commercial ships. 
so they won't be stopped by Britain and then they were brought to uh, Palestine and then once they docked on the borders of um, uh, near Tel Aviv then they equipped them with uh, machine guns and, and, and uh, uh, light weapons and artillery and then thereafter once uh, the war starts they buy a submarine from the US <clears throat> anyway so uh, but at the beginning they don't really have much uh, heavy munitions so Egypt comes in on the 15th and they start to advance they advance north from the south they start advancing north in Gaza um, they go to, they go past Rafah they go past Khan Yunus uh, they go to the city Medina to Gaza they go past Medina to Gaza without going into the details of the individual battles and skirmishes that takes place and they push out of Gaza they go north of Gaza as well uh, they go past Asqalan and they start going north they don't reach all the way to Tel Aviv but they start going north they face fierce resistance though they face fierce resistance remember the the, the Zionist groups there and the Jewish settlers, they are fighting a fight for them, it's a fight for survival. It's a fight for survival. They have come there, they have left everything. They were uh, being chased by the Germans in Europe. They've all escaped to Palestine. Uh, no other countries had really taken them in, and these are large numbers. And so for them, this was, uh, they were looking at it as a fight for survival, and the only way that they can establish a state. That's it. So they were fighting very few, uh, fiercely, uh, defending each of their positions, counter-attacking, uh, counter etc. But anyway, the, the Egyptian army pushes forward. They push forward, they push forward, and uh, um, I put like a map, uh, a flag there on the um, north, northest point. Uh, so they get past Gaza and they go to a few uh, areas ahead. On the east, the Iraqi forces and the Syrian forces they come in and uh, when they come in the uh, Transjordan forces sorry and the Iraqi forces the Transjordan forces they come they more towards the southern east, southeast they come towards Jerusalem they get to Jerusalem uh, in Jerusalem there are street battles house to house etc until eventually they uh, take over the whole of Jerusalem they take over the whole of uh, Jerusalem and uh, uh, the, with the Iraqi forces coming, uh, the Iraqi forces basically settle in the triangle uh, area of um, uh, Nablus, Janin, and Tul Karam. And these are the th uh, names which you probably hear in the news now the three main uh, camps which are being attacked by uh, or surrounded by the forces in the West Bank. So, as uh, the war is taking place in Gaza at the same time, uh, these three areas are the key areas of resistance in the West Bank uh, which are surrounded and uh, besieged and have been besieged multiple times uh, in the last few weeks by uh, the Israeli forces. So it's these same areas where the Iraqi uh, soldiers entered, uh, Janin, uh, Tul Karam and Nablus. Anyway, so that's where the Iraqi forces go. They have like a sort of outpost on a hill there, just next to Janin and um, the area of Janine was known for its resistance even against the, uh, the time of the British. Uh, so in 19, uh, end of 1935, uh, there was a group who were fighting against the British. Eventually, the, they were surrounded by over 100 soldiers. There were about 12 uh, Muslims on the, on, on the hilltop there, and uh, the, they were killed by the British in the uprising against the British in 1935. Um, so Janine was known for its um, uh, resistance. Anyway, so that's where the Iraqi forces came. They were on a hilltop. There were many times where the, the forces, the different Zionist groups tried to come and overrun their base, but uh, they had defended it. They defended it. Uh, so they took over basically what we can say is West Bank. The West Bank and slightly advanced even further out of the West Bank. Towards the north, we got the Syrian forces. They came in um, from the north. And the Lebanese forces came in as well from, from the northern border. So the Syrian forces from the northeast and the Lebanese directly from the north. The Syrian forces come in, they advanced a little bit. Uh, the Lebanese forces took over a, a few villages, towns. So if you look now, for example, in the north of uh, Israel, where the um, uh, skirmishes are taking place at the moment on the Lebanese border, uh, the skirmishes up to about five kilometers approximately so this was approximately the area which the Lebanese army in 1948 came in as well it was about 
approximately five kilometers maximum 10 kilometers in uh, one in an area where they came in they didn't come in much further than that um, and the Syrian forces they came in again they didn't take over large uh, an area the largest areas were taken by Egypt uh, and thereafter by the uh, uh, Jordan and Iraqi forces so this was the initial uh, stage of the war now the war was basically fought in three stages so you had the first stage of the war which lasted just about uh, uh, a month so the 15th of May till the 11th of June then they had a uh, truce uh, or a ceasefire like we had a ceasefire for seven days they had a ceasefire for about a month from 11th of June until the 8th of July and then they had a 10 day um, uh, war so the 8th of July to the 18th of July then they had another ceasefire the ceasefire lasted until the 15th of October so this was a bit longer ceasefire then the war started again on the 15th of October and then it continued all the way until the 10th of March 1949 which is the end of the war so uh, the Egyptian forces they bombed uh, the, the planes the Spitfire planes they bombed the uh, Tel Aviv airbase so remember we said they had an airbase with a few light um, aircraft so the aircraft a lot of them were damaged etc and uh, but the RAF British still had the uh, David airbase which was slightly north um, and it still exists today now it's an Israeli airbase so um, by mistake the uh, Egyptian forces instead of bombing the Tel Aviv airbase uh, in one of their sorties they bombed the British airbase the British shot down the uh, Egyptian planes eventually the Egyptians were left with no Spitfires they shot down all five Spitfires so um, they after that they couldn't really bomb the uh, um, the, the, the air base or the military bases or the military um, formations anywhere else but when they were advancing they obviously they were using their planes to advance to uh, target their formations uh, so once the truce or the ceasefire agreement takes place on the 11th of June now whenever all of these ceasefires take place there are UN resolutions etc uh, nobody is allowed to um, bolster their forces you can't get more weapons etc all of these things but obviously this, these rules were not uh, um, uh, followed by both sides but mainly by the uh, Zionist forces and this was something which was foreseen by the British so when the ceasefire took place for example you find in British unclassified documentation that amongst themselves the British uh, intelligence community for example are saying that what will happen now is that the Zionists have be, are calling uh, the Zionist Congress there is calling all of the Jews from around the world uh, to come and join them so at this point as soon as the war starts and all of these countries come the Jews are just flocking in ships the British have moved away from this from the ports so the ships are just coming to um, to the ports to come and join the war and the battle at the same time uh, they are now arming themselves they are now arming themselves uh, and they're getting arms so what we had was we have operation Balak and this was uh, in terms of the armaments and the weapons uh, this was you could say that or this was the biggest change or a change in the balance in terms of the munitions that were held by both sides so Operation Balak was a, was, a, uh, was a scheme that was set up so basically uh, uh, the Zionist forces they had supporters all around the world because they had obviously the World Zionist Congress they had Zionist agencies in the US, in Europe, all of Britain, everywhere so they had um, money coming in and they had funding for the war effort they had volunteers coming in uh, they had uh, mercenaries so individuals who had who are World War II veterans or sometimes even wet veterans of both World Wars from other countries who are coming and joining them and joining them in this fight um, and uh, some of them were not even Jewish like I mentioned before so from one of them was a former British RAF pilot his name was Gordon Levitt and Gordon Levitt he volunteered his services to the uh, Zionists or to the Israeli state to the Israelis and he said I will help you obviously they went through interrogation they said you're not a Jew why do you want to help us um, and uh, he himself uh, writes later on that they said to us okay we don't trust you but uh, we'll take you in and see what you want and what you can do for us 
Anyway, eventually what happens is he uh, he goes to Czechoslovakia and in Czechoslovakia they have a number of uh, fighter jets and planes and he flies, he the sort, he's from Czechoslovakia to Israel. From Czechoslovakia to Tel Aviv, he then brings in planes. He brings planes from Czechoslovakia to, to Tel Aviv and he drops them off. Then he goes back and drops them off. He goes back, drops them off. He brings another a few pilots. Uh, a couple of them uh, are caught in, in Greece. But uh, um, generally he's bringing in all of these planes and he brings them in planes, not only planes. He brings in tanks. He, bring, he brings in uh, aircraft uh, carriers that are, are full of munitions, full of heavy artillery. He's bringing in everything that's left over from World War II from Eastern Europe and he starts bringing it all in with his group and uh, eventually they bolster the, the uh, armaments that are held uh, by the Zionist forces so at this point they, still, they end up with um, fighter jets, they end up with tanks, heavy artillery, uh, air defense systems, uh, loads of munitions um, and all kinds of armaments and also uh, mercenaries so all veterans from the two world wars and so these are all brought in and this was Operation uh, Balak and the main individual who started it was Gordon Levitt they also brought in RF pilots or other f uh, pilots from uh, World War II who had flown planes in World War II to then help their effort in flying planes um, uh, in, in this bat in this war so this uh, so, so this was foreseen by the British uh, um, so the British said that the uh, what they said was that the Arab forces will basically be complacent so they'll go to sleep for a month they won't do anything because they've uh, come forward etc they think that the Zionist armies are probably tired we've already come so far we'll take over the rest eventually um, and they're basically busy already discussing how they're going to split the spoils those are the Arab countries who's going to take what and what will go to what and who will administer which area whereas the Zionist uh, uh, groups they will be busy in bolstering their uh, numbers and their weapons and that's basically exactly what took place so when the war restarts again on the 8th of July the balance has completely changed the balance has completely changed now obviously the, the planes started coming in at the end of May uh, towards the end of May uh, but they hadn't come in in the, uh, in the way that they had during that ceasefire so once the ceasefire is over on the 8th of July Suddenly, Israel goes on the, the Israeli armies or the uh, Zionist armies go on the offensive against the Arab armies. And basically, from this point onwards, from this point on onwards, the Arab armies don't take over any more land. They don't take over any more land. There's no further advancement of these armies. Uh, no real advancement. Um, there might be a bit of back and forth in some areas, but they didn't really advance anywhere after that. After that, they were basically left just in a defensive position. They were just being attacked from all sides by the Zionist forces um, and the armies and they were holding a defensive position. Uh, Egypt, for example, at this point, they get pushed back slightly but they are still on the borders of uh, Gaza. Um, they are surrounded in an area uh, called uh, Fallujah, which is in North Gaza. Um, and this is what the story is for uh, those 10 days. They are on defense but they are still sort of holding their ground. Another ceasefire after 10 days, 18th of July. Uh, again, there's UN re there are re UN resolutions, etc. But uh, it goes on until October. Again, the war starts again. And again, during this time, they're bringing in even more numbers. They're bringing in even more weapons and ammunition. Um, the Arabs brought in a few more numbers, but uh, they didn't really bring in much ammunition. And again, the same thing caused. So the, the Zionist forces, they continue from where they stopped on the 18th of July. Again, they come full-scale attack, uh, trying to uh, take over what they can, uh, etc. and push back the forces as much as possible. Eventually, by the end, by March, um, without going into all the details of all the dates, but by the 10th of March, when which is the armistice agreement, they have they during that period they push back the uh, Lebanese forces all the way inside Lebanon, and they enter Lebanon and take over thirteen villages. The Zionist forces um, on the 
southern front, they enter into Egypt, into the Sinai Desert. They then retreat. Uh, but they uh, go into the Sinai Desert. They completely push out the forces. Uh, then they retreat back to Rafah. Um, towards the east, the Syrian forces are driven out as well, in the northeast. The rest of the area of the West Bank, uh, remember the forces, the Syrian forces and the Iraqi forces had gone further than the West Bank. They pushed them back inside the West Bank, but then they stop because um, the West Bank is mainly all Arab. Many were Arab. There's not really many Jews living there. The only area where there were some Jews living was in West Jerusalem. So they come forward and they, ta uh, they to take over West Jerusalem, uh, and then they stop. They don't really push much further against the Transjordan and the um, uh, Iraqi troops. Although they fought against the Iraqi troops more, but they didn't really push forward much against the Transjordan troops. Uh, rather, they go south and focus their uh, efforts on the empty area. Uh, which was known as the the, the, uh, the wilderness uh, because there's not many people living there but it's a lot of land which they can take over um, and a few settlements here and there so they take over this whole uh, area uh, in the south going all the way to the bottom and so by the 10th of uh, March they have basically pushed back the Egyptian forces they've pushed back the Syrian forces they've pushed back the uh, Lebanese forces and they stopped uh, pushing the Jordan forces, Jordanian forces and Iraqi forces any more than they already had, which was approximately the West Bank. Uh, now here it's important that the Transjordan forces, they never planned and they didn't go any further than the West Bank. They didn't go any further than the, those lines that were outlined by the UN. And uh, there was actually an agreement or messages that were sent between the British and the ruler of Transjordan, we mentioned King Abdullah, that you can take up to this area only, don't enter into the other areas. And so he, his only goal was to go up to these areas. That's why he had told, uh, or the commands were that the Transjordan forces won't go any further than the lines or the boundaries set by the UN. Uh, but the forces of Lebanon and Syria were supposed to go past all, the, all of these uh, borders and go to Tel Aviv. And the Egyptian forces were supposed to go from the south and go up towards Tel Aviv. But they will stop here and they won't go any further. So this was the uh, instruction from the, uh, for, the Transjordan forces. Um, which was uh, obviously a, uh, an issue uh, from the other pro issues that they had and problems that they had. Uh, so that's where the war was left on the 10th of March 1949. Now just a few other uh, points. Uh, so from the 15th of May to 19, uh, sorry, from the 15th of May 1948 to the 10th of March uh, 1949, this was the whole war, 10 months. Yeah. So the whole war took 10 months. The fighting wasn't continuous in those 10 months, but this was the full period of the war. Uh, in uh, Once the war started, as soon as the war started, a um, a mediator was uh, sent by the UN. So the UN sent a mediator because the war is going on. So they sent the mediator. The mediator was a, uh, Sp a Swedish count. Uh, his name was uh, Folk Bernadotte. And his job was to, his, his role was a mediator between the Arabs, between the Arab League and the um, uh, Zionist groups uh, or the declared state of Israel. And he went there, he spoke to both groups, he surveyed the ground, he had a team, and he did a survey. Eventually, he publishes a report on the 16th of September. Okay, so many months later, but he publishes a report on the 16th of September. And when he publishes that report, he says that the Palestinians must be allowed to go back to their homes. The Palestinians must be allowed to go back to their homes. And this is big because now during this war, this is when the Nakba took place. So once the initial forces come in, then when the Zionist forces push back, they push back everybody. They don't just push back the soldiers. When they take over areas, they don't just push back the, uh, Israel, the, the uh, Egyptian forces or the Lebanese forces or the Syrian forces. No, no, no. They push back everyone, every man, woman and child who's Arab who's living in those areas. And that's where you had 700 to 750,000 uh, Arabs being driven from their homes in all of these areas. So this was the Nakba, when the Zionist forces 
from October until March, they drove, they drove out over 700,000 Palestinians from their homes. Anyway, we'll, uh, so uh, the report, so this, the Nakba hasn't even taken place yet, but the, uh, the report said that the Palestinians must be allowed back. So by this time, you've got about a couple of 100,000 uh, plus Palestinians who've been uh, taken away from their homes. So the report said, number one, they must be allowed back. Some of them have gone to Jordan, some of them have gone to um, uh, Egypt, some of them, a lot of them have gone to Syria and Lebanon. And if they choose not to return, so if the Palestinians choose not to return because they don't want to live under the, the rule there or they feel threatened or they feel, they feel unsafe, then the Israeli government or the Israeli state must recompense them for all of their losses. This is what he said. As soon as he did that, what was he accused of? Anti-Semitism. He was accused of anti-Semitism, being a Nazi, um, and uh, they called him a Nazi agent, and uh, they said that he needs to got, be gotten rid of, he's just an Arab in Western clothing. And so the Stern gang, Lehi, what they did was, uh, they said that Nazi agent, he's in our land, we need to get rid of him. On the 17th of September, so literally the day after he publishes the report, the day after the report is published, he, him and his French assistant, so they're in uh, Jerusalem, their convoy is attacked and they are both assassinated. Both of them assassinated. Their fingers were pointed at the Stern gang um, at Lehi. Anyway, so uh, this, this is what the UN was doing at that time. They had sent this man and he said the Palestinians should be able to return. If not, they must be recompensated. What happens? He is assassinated. And we saw the same thing that they did with the British previously. They assassinated the British, uh, um, ass attempted assassination of the High Commissioner, etc. So uh, Ben Gurion, who's the, um, uh, who was the Prime Minister, the first Prime Minister and who declared the State of Israel, he was in charge of all of the armed forces, uh, he said this. He said that until the British left, until the British left, no Jewish settlement, however remote, no Jewish settlement, however remote, was entered or sieged by the Arabs. The Arabs did not besiege or enter any Jewish settlement, no matter how remote it was. They were fighting the, 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 the Jewish settlers who were attempting to enter into the Arab towns and Arab villages and the Arab lands. But the Haganah, which was the main parliamentary, parliamentary, Zionist parliamentary force, uh, captured many Arab positions. And uh, in his words, they liberated uh, Tiberias, Haifa, Jaffa, and Safat. He writes this in The Rebirth and Destiny of Israel. So as you can see, this was uh, the, the vision. Uh, in fact, at this time, once they stopped, they thought that... Um, uh, they, because they were in the upper hand at the end of 1948, that we can take over the whole of uh, the area of Palestine and establish the original state of Israel. So we can go all the way to the uh, uh, Jordan River. However, they stopped taking into account political matters. Because what was happening at that time was the uh, Israeli fighter jets, um, they had uh, not only attacked the Egyptian positions and the uh, army Arab positions within Palestine, but they had gone and attacked uh, inside all of these countries as well. They attacked, they bombed Damascus, uh, they they bombed in Lebanon, uh, they bombed uh, Amman in Jordan, they bombed Egypt, they bombed Cairo. Uh, in fact, in, in Amman, uh, the capital of Jordan, they went and they bombed right next to the British RAF base. And if you remember the, the Egyptians, um, they bombed the base by mistake. All of the fighter jets were shot down. At this point, the British didn't shoot down the Israeli fighter jets. But what they did say was that the next time, if you are to bomb in this area, then we'll shoot your planes down. So they didn't bomb again. But um, they did continue to bomb. Later on, later on, uh, there were skirmishes with British aircraft. By the, by the Israeli Air Forces. Uh, skirmishes took place with British aircraft. British aircraft were shot down. Pilots were uh, captured. So this was after the agreement took place that the airplane shouldn't be entering into, for example, Egyptian airspace or uh, Jordanian airspace. 
and they did, uh, British planes were, were scrambled because that's where the British bases were. Because remember, from World War One, uh, sorry, and World War Two, uh, so uh, and the colonialist period, and so uh, the British uh, planes were scrambled. British planes were shot down. British pilots were uh, were captured by the Zionist forces. Uh, at one point, a couple of the British planes were like in the Sinai Desert. Uh, ben Gurion ordered the uh, Zionist forces uh, to go and drag the, the debris and the remains of these planes into Israel, into the land of state control, so that, this, these, so that this, uh, the remains are under their control and belong to them. Uh, so there were skirmishes which took place even with the British um, uh, at this time. So this is what uh, took place in 1948. Uh, with regards to all of these different factors, obviously it's quite complicated. Uh, there's a lot of different factors involved, different reasons. Um, but uh, by the end of 1948, once the armistice agreement, so you know, sometimes you remember the, you hear the green line. Um, so the green line agreement, the ground armistice agreement, uh, is the map which we saw uh, last week, and uh, which is basically similar to what we see uh, today. Uh, in terms of when they draw the maps of Gaza, the short, the small strip, and the West Bank with uh, East Jerusalem to the Palestinians, basically, and West Jerusalem uh, was supposed to be international. Um, I the proposal from previous was that the uh, was that Jerusalem would be under UN control, so it wouldn't be for either party. But anyway, this was what, uh, what happened at the time of uh, the end of the war in 1948, in 1949, on the 10th of March, on the Green Line, uh, which uh, you will you you'll definitely have heard of uh, when they say it's on the Green Line, the armistice, uh, and this is where we ended up at the end of the war. Inshallah, we'll continue uh, on the events which took place after this uh, next uh, week. Inshallah, Taala. Before we finish, if there are any questions or Anything else? Yeah, I wanted to ask you, not so about Operation Badr. Um, first of all, I'm going to say, the guy who called him, what was he, was he a mercenary? Is that an army? Is that an army? Okay, so uh, with regards to Operation Balak, uh, where the uh, Zionist forces are getting all the weapons, mm -hmm. mainly from Czechoslovakia, then when that base was discovered, they went to Yugoslava uh, uh, Yugoslavia, um, Gordon uh, Levitt, he was a former RAF pilot in World War II from the British. So he's a mercenary for the um, uh, Zionist forces, uh, but he's a former British RAF pilot. He was a former British. Uh, so they just fly straight over the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah, straight over the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, obviously, once the war advanced towards the end of the war, uh, they were loading the bombs in Yugoslavia in the planes. Mm -hmm. They'll go bomb Egypt and then land in, uh, in Israel with the delivery of the plane. So they'll bomb before they even have delivered the plane into Israel. Any other? Uh, so, uh, the Masjid al-Aqsa, when they came in, uh, the, was under the control of the Jordanian forces, or the Trans-Jordan forces. For this time, yes. <laughs> After that, what took place, we'll, we'll discuss. But for this time, it was under Trans-Jordan forces. Uh, there was, obviously, in West Jerusalem, the, the, uh, that was overtaken by the Zionist uh, different forces that were there. West Jerusalem. Any other questions? No? Okay, inshallah, next week uh, we'll continue from the events that took place after this, inshallah ta'ala. We ask that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, assist our brothers and sisters uh, in Palestine, in Gaza. As we all know, the bombing and the attacks have started again from this morning. We ask that Allah Azza wa Jal alleviates their suffering, uh, removes the oppression, and Allah Azza wa Jal grants them liberation and uh, victory and Allah Azza wa Jal grants them peace and security.